are old Takahashi refractors any good? I've been trying to answer that question for decades. And by old, I mean pre-ED glass, pre-fluorite. These were sold as acromats largely in the 1970s. Now, these things do show up occasionally for sale in the U.S., not very often, but they do show up quite a bit in Japan on one of the local auction sites like Zen Market. And over the years, I have been tempted to bid on one of these things, but I could never quite bring myself to do it. There's the hassle of the exchange rate, and I don't know what the shipping is. I just didn't want to deal with it. But luckily, there was a viewer who was living in Japan for a short time, and while he was over there, he bought two of these. These are Takahashi TS-65 refractors. And he wrote to me, he said, when I get back to the United States, I'm going to keep one of these for myself. Do you want the other one? To which I replied, ah, yes, I do. <laughs> and about a week later, this case showed up, all 37 pounds of it on my doorstep. Now, if you're old enough, you remember when entry-level telescopes actually used to be good. It wasn't like it is today. Tasco started off life as a very good telescope supplier, brand labeling quality equipment from Japan. And if you have any telescopes from this period, you are used to seeing these casket-shaped cases all the time. And there were many of them out there, and they were all good. You know, Monolux, Toa, Hallmar, uh, you know, Swift, Mayflower, Unitron, you know, Mead, some of the early Meads were that way, and Sears. Yes, Sears were sometimes brand labeling quality Yamamoto telescopes from Japan. Very nice telescopes, by the way, and highly sought after today. It wasn't until about the 1980s when something sinister happened, and these manufacturers, Tasco in particular, began brand labeling useless plastic junk from China, turning them into the brand that we all love to hate. Well, how good were these actually? I don't know. Were these just the same as all of the other Japanese refractors that were out there, or was there something special about these because they had the Takahashi nameplate on them? Let's open up the casket and find out. So the person who sent this to me also sent along these catalogs. These came from Starbase. That's the retailer in Tokyo. And wow, I mean, look at this. <laughs> they, they don't make catalogs like this in the U.S. anymore. I wish they did. Just really first-rate printing and wow, look at that. Just great stuff. I wish I read Japanese, but unfortunately I, I don't. I'm going to find somebody around here who can read this stuff to me. And I don't know about you, looking at this, I want all of this stuff. Really, really great. Okay. Opening up the case, now the person who sent this to me did tell me two things uh, to be aware of. Number one, it is missing the tripod legs and the tripod flange. There's nothing he can do about that. We can deal with that later. But even looking at this, those of you who know Takahashi, there are styling cues, you know, this knob, this knob here. This is from 1978. You can tell by the nameplate here, usually the first two digits are the, the year, but we're talking almost 50 years and they're still using these knobs and these styling cues today. And there's a screw off cap for the finder. This again, way better than it has to be. And there's a nice thread off cap for the visual back as well. And you're probably familiar with this compression ring. If you know Takahashi, that hasn't changed either. And the action on this is really, really smooth. It didn't take more than a few minutes of me looking through this to realize that this is much better than, uh, at least cosmetically so far, than most of these other Japanese refractors from this period. There, if somebody can read that for me, read that for us, let us know what that says. I assume it's a warranty card of some kind. And, you know, the mount, really, really heavy duty. Precision, I mean, look at the way that the setting circles are. This is very nice. Now, there is a uh, nut and a screw at the bottom here. That is to go through the mount. I'm going to deal with that in just a moment here. And we've got the counterweight. But I want to draw your attention here. Um, this is the erect image device. And usually, this is a throwaway. 
and you may, be, may not be able to tell, this is extremely well made. But look at this eyepiece case. Look at this. I don't even have to look through these eyepieces to know that these are quality items. There's a Kellner 25, an orthoscopic, that's a 12.5, and a Kellner 9, of course, 965 inch. But if nothing else here, I am glad that I finally have a quality 0.965 inch diagonal. So the lack of the tripod legs was one of the two major problems with this telescope. The other one is mold on the lens. Several club members gave their views on this mold issue, including one person whose opinion I respect very much, who told me to just throw the whole thing away. The mold has already destroyed the coatings and has likely affected the optical surface as well. He's seen mold multiply and work its way into adjacent optics, and he's seen entire collections destroyed. I couldn't bring myself to throw this thing away, so I went to see Mike, who wanted to attempt to clean the lenses. I'm guessing this lens cell hasn't been disassembled since 1978 because various rings and retainers were very stuck. Mike has a trip for dropping the lens cell over a cup. It's important that you mark the orientation of the lenses so you can put it back together again and do it in pencil, not magic marker, because we're going to be using alcohol, which is going to dissolve the marker marks. By the way, I hope you can see from this photo, this lens cell is of very high quality. Here are the lenses separated. Note the foil spacers. Those will have to come off too, and they will need to go back into their original orientation. We doused the lenses in alcohol. Here we are putting the optics back into the lens cell. And here's the final result. You can see the damage the mold did, but at least that messy brown stuff is gone. And after all this, I generously sprayed the entire inside of the case, the tube, the inside of the tube with Lysol. I almost emptied the entire can. So the first order of business here is to find a suitable tripod. I had to find something that would hold the mount and something that wasn't being used for anything else. And we found a solution in, of all places, the Galileo scope. <laughs> Those of you watching here may recall a couple of years ago, somebody gave me a telescope in a banana box from some shopping network, and it turned out to be a lot better than anybody expected. But these tripod legs actually work well here, and you know what, I, I think it actually looks good. Now these tripod legs are quite a bit lighter than the OEM tripod legs, so just keep that in mind. How is the telescope? In a word, fabulous. I knew within seconds of looking through this thing that it was special. I've looked through lots of vintage telescopes. This is much better. Whatever they're doing, it's working. And it's a lot of little quality of life improvements too that they did because this, this knob here, you always see me complain that these slow motion knobs fall off. This is the first case where it never fell off. The finder is a five by 25. It is much better than it has to be. And I'll tell you what, there's something that inspires confidence when you have a good finder attached to your telescope. You can actually see the object, you know where you're supposed to be, or you know where you're not supposed to be and you need to move. Okay, so I use the stock eyepieces, again, much better than you might think, especially at 20 millimeter Kellner, but eventually I did want to start using my own inch and a quarter eyepieces, so I use one of these things. It's a 0.965 to inch and a quarter adapter, and when you put that in there, now I can use my normal diagonal and eyepieces, and things got even better. And I'll tell you, with a seven millimeter Nagler in the first evening, I was catching shadow transits on Jupiter. Stars are sharp, it's contrasty, and there is shockingly little false color there. The guys were talking about this, and it may be because back in the 1970s, they were using lead glass, which they don't use today. Now, in the hands of the right designer, that lead glass may allow you to create an optical system that has less false color. Anyway, it's a theory. Whatever the explanation, it's good, I don't care, it works. It's so good that I started using these. These are webcam lunar planetary cameras. This is the ASI-120MM. That's the Dash S variant. That's the monochrome. And this is the 662MC. This is the color variant. Now, typically, you know, acromats don't do very well under this kind of imaging, and we're kind of getting into the realm of silliness. But, you know, who cares? Let's try it. And if you look at these images, you can see just a little bit of false color around Jupiter if your monitor is good, but the moon looks terrific. So just for comparison, I did take out two commonly known refractors from this time period just to see how they compared. 
we have the TASCO number 7TE and the Unitron number 114. Now the TASCO is here because of all of the vintage scopes, this is probably the one that you're going to run across most commonly should you decide to get into this area of the hobby. The Unitron is here because of its reputation for fine optics. I also wanted to play with the Altas mount again. I haven't done that in a while. Both of these brands have very serious fan bases. And by the way, if you only know Tasco from its unfortunate later years, you'd be really surprised at how beautifully made this instrument is. This leaves no apologies for anything, either optically or mechanically. These were quality instruments imported from Japan from places like Royal Astro and Toa. So I was out here for several nights, enough to form a consistent opinion. And you want to know what I think? The Tasco and the Unitron are good. They're even good plus maybe even the very good range. The Takahashi is just in another plane altogether. It's just plain better in every way. Optics, mechanically, it's more stable. And keep in mind, the actual original tripod will make this even more stable than what I have on here. And again, a lot of those little quality of life creature comforts just plain better here. The mount is smoother. The finder is so much better. Uh, I didn't like the finder on the Unitron very much. And I know that there are fans out there of the Unitron Altas mount. I, it feels like time has passed that by. I would have preferred to see one of Unitron's equatorial mounts. Now, this is nowhere near a scientific test. The apertures, the focal ratios are off, and time has not been equally kind to all three of these. But the trend was clear. The Takahashi just plain better than both of these fine as they were. I can say I'm surprised. When this first started, my bias was that this was going to be pretty much the same as all of the other Japanese refractors from the time period. It's not. This is clearly in another class. It's good enough that I think I'm going to seek out a set of genuine tripod legs. This is problematic because I've been looking around and prices for these things are all over the map. I've seen legs only going for $300 US, and that's before shipping from Japan. And I have seen entire outfits, including the whole telescope with the tripod legs all together, and sometimes those will sell for under $150. I think what that tells me is the market has not quite discovered this yet. And that's good because I'm gonna to try to snag one, but before I do that and try my luck at places like Zen Market, if anybody has a genuine set of tripod legs and the flange for a Takahashi TS-65, let me know in the comments below. Maybe we can work something out. It's that good. You know, when I started this review, I figured, you know, I've, I've got a little sun porch off the kitchen and I put the, the vintage scopes out there and sometimes guys will come out there and look at it. Uh, no, I think this is going to make its way into the regular rotation. It's that good. I've already taken out a couple of times and experienced astronomers and beginners alike both tell me that this is quite good. It makes an excellent complement if I happen to be taking out, for example, a six inch Dobsonian. So there you have it. A look at the Takahashi TS-65 Acromat from the late 1970s. I hope you found this information interesting. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.